I think it's important to like make music, yeah. put it out there. Oh, it's not good. Oh, you didn't like it. Oh, you gave it a bad review. Whatever. I'm making another record. Right. And I'm making another record. Maybe like my fourth album. Hi, this is Justin Coletti from Sonic Scoop, coming at you from Gigantic Studios. We're doing another video in our B&H series of interviews with some of our favorite producers and engineers, and we're really thrilled to have Chris Zane here for this one. One other thing I've heard you talk about a little bit is this idea of trying to track things so that they sound mixed, so that by the time you get to the mixed part of the process, you don't have to create this whole new monster. And I think it's a great idea, but how do you do it? And how do you keep that in mind? How do you execute on that concept as you go along? In the past, I have recorded everything kind of like normal, and then I was like, all right, now let's get into it later. And now let's mix it and like right. do all the stuff to it. And I've started to kind of change my approach where I said, maybe, you know, maybe I should just commit to what I want it to be because yeah. it makes things easier down the line. But it so greatly affects the rest of the process, right. right? And all these kids that are making records at home, the one thing I hear all the time from them is, I mix as I go, I mix as I go. Mm -hmm. So that every time they record a vocal, they put 70 plugins on it, mm -hmm. so that it sounds awesome, and then they move on to the next thing. Whereas sometimes I'm making a record and I might just leave the vocal just sitting there dry and loud and they'll just be like, what are we doing? And I'm like, oh, don't right. worry about that, we'll just ignore it, you know? Mm -hmm. But I've come to realize like, wow, it might inform us more Sure. if that was closer to what it should be. And I think part of my reason for probably skirting that issue is because I exist so much in an analog world right. that, you know, if you're just in the box, you can be like, give me five minutes and I'll put a whole bunch of plugins on it and make it sound cool. But I'm like, we don't want those plugins on there, so let's mm -hmm. just leave it for now and later we're going to mix it through all this gear, you know? Yeah. But I've kind of started to see the advantages to, like you said, tracking as you want it to be mixed. And to me, that just means picking what you want and kind of committing to it. And right. you know what? If you don't like it, change it, right. redo it. I think yeah. it's better to just make a bold move and do it and three days later be like, mate, I know you're gonna hate me, but we gotta redo this. Right. And then just redo it boldly how you want at that time. Yeah. But like trying to be wishy-washy and nobody wants that. Now, when it comes to actually getting down to the, the mix portion, would you say that most of the projects that you're recording, you're also mixing? Most, yeah. And would you say that most of the projects you're mixing, you're also recording, or is it uh, do you sometimes no, just no? Sometimes through? we do just mixes because yeah. I'll get really fried, burnt out on sure. producing records, and after a couple months, I'll just say to my manager, like, "Can we just get some mix work in? Like, I just need yeah. routine, easy. Half the time, that means the band won't be here, and it's just." It makes me feel a little more human. I can come in at 11 a.m., I can leave at 7, still sure. go home at reasonable hour. And so between those two different uh, scenarios, you're mixing something that you recorded or you're mixing something that's been handed to you, do you start in different ways depending on whether you've been recording it as, uh, on one I'd side? i probably start from a better point, to be honest, if I didn't record it because... Mm. I'm so much more objective and I'm just hearing it and doing it. I feel yeah. like definitely some of my best mixes are records that I did not do. The way that I start any mix is probably actually pretty similar. Mm -hmm. It is label everything and then I put all the faders physically about where I think they should be mm -hmm. and then I mute everything on the board mm. except for the drums and the main instrument, let's just say it's a synth, the main synth, sure. and then I will bring the vocal in and out. And I will probably mm. listen to it like that for the first 10 minutes. Right. Because in my mind, I'm thinking that the core DNA of any song is the drums, yeah. the vocal, and whatever the instrument is that's telling me what the key is, what the vibe is, all that stuff. Yeah. Everything else is probably just decoration. Right. Or it's sectional. It's something that comes in for a certain section. Sure. So I kind of take stock like that, and I work the mix up from there. And I keep the bass muted mm. a lot. Mm. for like a lot of it. For the first 30%, the bass will be out. And then I'll start to bring it in, and I'll get it where I like it, and then I'll mute it again. Mm. And I'll just basically keep doing that till I feel like I've got the drums and the main key part or whatever in the vocal as big and widescreen as possible. Yeah. And then I'll just 
bring the bass in and let that run amok and just kind of, I always think of the bass as just like pouring pancake mix into a muffin pan. Mm. And it's just going to go and flow into all those little cups and sure. fill up every hole that it can roll into. So before I'm going to pour that mix in, I want to make sure that everything else is like sounding good and carved out where it needs to be. And sure. that's kind of generally how I'll approach like every mix. Gotcha. And do you find it's best to start in a particular section? So you're going for your most important elements first. You try to do this in a most important section or is it just kind of from the top down? It's not from the top down. It's kind of like whatever the hook is. Sure. So maybe that's the chorus. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's right. before the verse. Maybe it's after the chorus. Whatever it is. It's kind of the like main riff of the song or something. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely wouldn't say start from the, like, the top of the song. Right. I kind of start at whatever section has the main vibe. The sure. drums are playing, that main key thing is playing, and I yeah. just try to get like the tent poles of the mix. Yeah, so this first, first ten, 10 minutes when you're creating kind of the structure of the mix, the, the core of the mix, are you diving into EQ and compression and reverb and all that then, or is it just getting that balance to sit at that point? Uh, a little of both. I mean, yeah. I think that's you know one of the advantages to working on a sure. analog desk, obviously, is that in the time that it would take somebody to look at the channels, think about it, listen to it, open up some plugins, import their template, I could have a pass through 30 faders and already start putting some EQ on and will be plugged into my mix chain. And you know, you'd be surprised how often uh, at the beginning of a mix, I'll just start bringing a couple faders up and the mm -hmm. artist will be like, holy sh that <laughs> sounds good already. And I think that a lot of that is nothing to do with me you know right. it other than to recognize that it does sound really good so let's not kill it but yeah i i don't think in stages now it's time to put reverbs now it's time to compress like right. it's just a zuga 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 it's just happening <laughs> all the time that's the benefit of this i yeah. think i do kind of have a mixed template is mm -hmm. in terms of like what gear i have patched in where it is on the desk sure. so that stuff is kind of just there i don't have to think about it too much it doesn't vary too too much yeah. if i want to add something or take something away i might do it in the middle of a mix but for the most part my assistant could walk in here right now and set this console up to mix right. without having to ask me anything he would know what i want where i want it so and like labeling it's a crucial part because it allows you to not to think about anything right you just you get the infrastructure of your uh you know your sends and returns set up and then you you can just take it out of your mind and just listen right i mean it shouldn't matter it shouldn't matter where it's coming up or what it's called or we don't want to be doing that we want to just sure. be like doing this this totally. is fun and we're listening but when you're like oh uh, clicking and you know, yeah, there are a few good. things worse than trying to go back and forth between those two mindsets. I mean, once you get into some kind of creative flow to get brought out of it and start thinking about numbers and patches, it's uh, yeah. going to be a bit of a drag. Well, uh, speaking of that, when it comes to keeping perspective when you're in a mix, first of all, how do you keep yourself from going too far down the rabbit hole and starting to make these changes that seem to be making everything worse or do they matter? Yeah. How do you keep perspective? How do you go in and out of the mix in a way that, that works? Breaks. Yeah. You got to take a lot of breaks. I would say sometimes I take breaks almost up to the point where I would think the band is like, yo, what the does this dude like hate this? Like, why is he? Because I actually find myself taking breaks when I really like something, not mm. when I'm frustrated. Right. So if I get frustrated, I mean, I'll take a break. But most of the time you'll hear me say, boom, that sounds good. Yeah. I'm going to take 10 minutes right. and leave it and not ruin it. Whether it's yeah. sitting on the couch for 10 minutes, whether it's walking around the block, you know, so just being able to walk with whoever wants to go get a coffee and I'll walk with them and it makes a huge difference. The other sure. thing that I think that it's crucial to not losing perspective is switching speakers. Mm. You know, there's so much talk about what speaker, what monitor is this and what monitor has Gear Sluts decided this year is the right. best monitor. Doesn't matter, I don't think. You find yeah. what you like, what works for you, stay with it. But... More than that, what I think is really the key is just constantly switching, you know. I've got sure. PMCs, KRKs, NS10s, that little radio from the UK. Yeah. And then I also have the mix set up to stream to a laptop or phone right, at right. any time. So between those five cool. things, 
you know, I'm really switching a lot. Can I ask what uh, what's the app that you use to stream out to an iPhone yes. and an iPad? It's free. It's called NiceCast. Oh, sure. It takes yeah. a little setting up. You yeah. might have to call your internet provider to have them open up a particular port. But yeah, yeah I stole that directly from Michael Brower, who sure. uses it to make revisions with bands that aren't there, which I have used yeah. as well. But more often, I, I use it to just stream to a net, you know, to my laptop or whatever, rather than right. having to make an MP3 and email it. And you know, there's something to something to be said for like having my laptop here and like listening to it and yeah. just being like, oh, let me raise that and then hear it raised. Totally. So yeah, big supporter of Nicecast. Thank you, whoever <laughs> makes that Amoeba <laughs> or something. Yeah. One of the other things I noticed is you have your NS10s off to the side. They're not in the center. They're not straight up in the middle of the meter bridge. Why is that? Is it an acoustic mono kind of thing? Or what's the... Started uh, because I just didn't have enough room, right? to be totally honest. I hate NS10s. Mm -hmm. Let's say that. That's okay? their job. Which, yeah. <laughs> to be and, I, and I get it. I yeah. got all that. But yeah. I, I hate them, but I use them. That's right. You know, I'm not one way or the other. I don't love them and I only use them. I don't hate them and never use yeah. them. I dislike them, but I recognize their use and I use them right. all the time. But I think it, originally I was just like, I hate these things. Why do I want to be sitting in front of these things? Right. Like, let's, but then it just became obvious that there just wasn't room. So mm -hmm. I stuck them over there. And then I noticed kind of added benefit, yeah. which was, A, it's now another speaker that's not directly in front of me. Mm -hmm. I think it's quite useful to flick a switch and hear the song f coming from somewhere else. Right. You know, it gives you like a bit of a different perspective. And also because they can be so harsh, I think it's quite nice for them not to be in front of you. But sometimes I will flick them on and wheel over and sit directly in front of them. Mm. And now I'm not looking at the master section. I'm not looking really at the faders. Anything that's down that far on the console is going to be like effects returns. So there's nothing right. for me to even futz with. And you're kind of left with nothing to do but sit there and just listen. Yeah. You know, and I think that that's really useful. It's like a break from mixing without taking a break from mixing. You slide right. over. And I've always said sometimes we do some of our best mixing when we're not mixing and just getting your hands away from the console right. and you're listening again for that. Right. So you'll notice on the other side, monitor sure. is not in the middle of the speakers, which it was for many years. And a lot of people walk in here, they're like, are you crazy? You're going to turn sideways. And But this seems very bad to me. And sure. it just kind of struck me one day that uh, we were listening to a mix and I turned around and everybody's just staring at the screen intently, right. waiting for something to happen. And I just hit stop. I'm like, what are you guys doing? What are yeah. we doing? We're making music. We're not playing a video game. Right. You're all just watching it. Like, it doesn't even matter how it sounds. You're just watching it, you yeah. know? So then I started doing this thing where I would turn it off whenever mm -hmm. we would listen. The band would be like, can you turn the screen back on? And we're bored like, now. Why? What do you need to see, you know? Yeah. And I was like, we're going to move this. Yeah. And so we came up with a system where I moved it. You know, for the most part, uh, I try to make records from right here. Yeah. And if I need to go over there and do something, I go over and do it, and then I come back. Sure. So when I'm mixing... I will wheel over and open a plug-in, and then I will wheel back to the mix position and keep mixing the song. Yeah. And that keeps me from mixing with my eyes instead of my ears. I hear you. It's funny. There's something to be said for visual stimulation, for visual feedback. But if you're listening to your own music and you're bored without visual stimulation, maybe there's a problem that you can fix uh, in the speakers yeah. rather than... Yeah, I don't know if it's boredom or if it's just right. validation. Like, they see it and they're like, mm, yeah, look at how square that is. Or, <laughs> ooh, there is the chorus and everything comes in just like it should right. because they're so paranoid that maybe it's not there. I don't know what it is, I but I know that I put the kibosh on it as much as possible. Gotcha. And I have to do it to myself sometimes, too. I'm sure. So I guess the ultimate question, I think, for keeping perspective when you're mixing is, how do you know when you're done? Well, I don't know. Maybe you don't. I think when it, you can listen from the beginning to the end and it ticks every emotional moment. Mm. Each little section, what's supposed to happen, beep, like you feel that, yeah. you probably job done. Yeah. Could it be better? Yes. Could it be different? Definitely. Yeah. Could it be worse? Probably. Sure. But, I mean, come on, man. I, I think it's important to, like, make music, yeah. put it out there. Oh, it's not good? Oh, you didn't like it? Oh, you gave it a bad review? Whatever, I'm making another record. Right. And I'm making another record. Maybe you like my fourth album. <laughs> you know, there's too much of this calculated hype machine SoundCloud mentality where kids are like, I got one chance, right. one chance only to impress the blogs. And if they don't like <laughs> it, like, f that. 
Yeah. So I think it's important to just do, do, make more, create, 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 do, do. Yeah. You know, and I look back at all these people with these vast catalogs like Led Zeppelin. Sure. And like you can just look at the album. You don't have to go any further than the album titles to know how much they were overthinking it. Right. They literally couldn't be bothered to name the records. They were like, <laughs> one, two, three. Does it make you feel good? Does it sound good? Yeah. It's probably done. Right. That's the gauge that I basically use. Well, I think you touched on an alternative metric for a lot of engineers, <laughs> what you should measure your mix by, that when you say it, it sounds so obvious, but I don't know if it's where most engineers immediately go. I think a lot of people are listening for, does, is the kick drum and the, the snare drum sounding banging enough? You know, uh, Is it going to impress other engineers? Mm -hmm. Is no one going to yell at me that a sound is bad? Rather than have that metric be, did I get emotionally something from the section to section changes in the song and even just to reframe your mind and to think in that way i think it'd be huge that said i guess you've occasionally listening to some of your sounds you must be thinking is the kick drum sound banging you know are these sounds huge because you get some huge sounds but uh if that's the final arbiter i guess that's uh yeah i mean i think the best mixers almost solely see it from that point of view and again mm. this is something that i think i have tons of room for improvement where I sure. still might focus too much on is the kick drum banging or right. isn't that the coolest reverb sound right. whereas one of the greats is just like listening to those moments and those lifts and those pulls yeah. and they make the whole song pull you along till it's done and then you just want to hear it again. As a producer I feel like you've got a mental checklist of what each song is supposed to bring to the table yeah. and if you can make it to the end and you feel like you've pretty much ticked those boxes it's probably done. Yeah. You're in good company because when I hear people like uh, Manny Merrick and Michael Brower talk about this stuff, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about the arc of the song, yeah. why it's emotionally doing. And there are some Michael Brower mixes I've heard where it's like, oh, that's not impressive from an audio engineering perspective, but it's great. Yeah. And uh, yeah. That's I mean, a, he mixed a record for me. And when I first heard it, I was like, oh, that sounds okay. I mean, it sounds mm -hmm. good. It doesn't sound like, oh my God, <laughs> yeah. I could never do that. <laughs> right. But what it did do yeah. was that exact thing where it just like served the song so well and every second of every minute felt justified and purposeful sure. and emotional and, and it just, yeah, it was just like, now that's something I can't do. Right. It just, yeah, he just, he just killed it. It's lo no longer how does the kick drum sound, it's how does the song sound, how does the yeah. performance sound, that's huge. And I think that's major advantage to that is just mixing it, sure. having nothing to do with the production of it. And I right. think there, there's a reason why you get all these guys that are really great mixers that just mix. Right. Because it'd be very interesting to see what happened if you had Manny, you know, spend six months working on an Imagine Dragons record right. and then was like, all right, mix it. You'd probably be like, <laughs> oh. But when you just, when it just walks in the door, yeah. I think that flash of objectivity and perspective is really what yeah. can help start you on the right path of like, sure making the moments matter instead of like the individual elements. Absolutely. That a division of labor can be extremely useful, like you're talking about. And it makes me uh, wonder, is a mastering engineer still a big part of your process? Because I think more often I hear people who are just starting more at the beginning stage of the game, they are looking for engineers to mix and master the recording. And to me, I always figured it's not mastering, it's making it louder. Uh, but maybe I'm too stodgy about that. Uh, yeah. What do you think? What's the role of a master? I've never what mastered anything in my life. Yeah. And no one should ever ask me to because <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. Right. I would say it's a big part of the process for me still. Yeah, I find it to be very important. Now, how much I'm leaning on them, that might be a different story. I might sure. not be leaning on them at all, but I still see it as a very important part. I think that earlier on in my career, I definitely would like come with like feeble mix in hand and be like, right. can you please make this sound good? <laughs> but um, less and less that happens sure. now generally. And I feel like even in the last few years, some of the guys I work with have encouraged me like, dude, don't worry about me. Like, yeah. that's just some shit for the forums. Like, mm -hmm. if you want to mix it loud, mix it loud. Bring it to me. I'll let you know if it's too loud. Do yeah. it, you get it as close as you can get it. And that's another common thread that I've seen with some of these killer guys is yeah. their mixes pretty much kind of come in the way they want them to sound brower manny spike whoever yeah. the master guy is not like all right let me dig in now and fix this mix like yeah. mix already sounds awesome they're just there to give it that last two percent yeah that said there's definitely times where i'm like dude this is like uh you know an a minus mm -hmm. or like a b plus could you can you yeah. help me get it up there a little bit and you know 
That's definitely sure. Greg Kelby has saved me a few times. Joe Laporta has saved me a few times. They're great ones. But for the most part, I, I just try to get it sounding pretty great the way I want it to sound. And I will deliver my mix and then I will deliver a quieter mix without any limiting on it. Sure. And be like, you've got it if you need it. Use this as a reference. Yeah. And that's kind of it. Well, one of my last questions I wanted to ask around the mixing process is you've got a board here, automation in it. Is automation a big part of mixes? Is it more about finding one fader setting for a song or is it more about letting things develop? No. I, I use faders a lot. Yeah. When I was looking for a new console, I had a need for 10 years, had flying faders. I used it religiously when I was looking for an SSL. I was very implicit that I needed to have automation. Sure. And the broker was like, okay, it's going to cost more. It's going to be more to maintain. It's a real pain in the butt. So I get it. Yeah. But I need it and I like it. And I right. think that it makes a big difference because, you know, it's not just the levels aren't just going up and down on a desk like this. There's actual you know, some subtle audio black magic happening in the VCAs. Sure. But beyond that, I, I don't work in an office and I don't fancy myself sitting in front of a computer clicking for 10 hours. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it in the box. That's just how my brain works. It's just easier for me to see a fader, touch a fader, move a fader, not look at a fader, Yeah. listen and move a fader. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah, it's a big, big part of it. Ergo, why I've got this stupid big Console. Sure. It sounds like even if uh, in some future you were to change to digital, there's still a realm for, I mean, the physical control. I think that's one of the biggest shortcomings of digital to me still is not the sound as much as the, the control mechanism. Yeah. I mean, we don't have to get into that rabbit hole because I sure. feel like I've retired from even having that argument. <laughs> However, uh, I think you know which side I sure, come up on. Of... I think you've hit the nail on the head, which is... If you want to have that argument with me, let's just forget about the sound, mm -hmm. okay? Let's just say all things being equal, they sound the same. Yeah. There, is, there is no argument. There is no denying mm -hmm. that this yeah. is better than this. <laughs> it's faster, yeah. and it's just more interactive, more human. And yeah. somebody actually hit me with a, with a really good metaphor about it one day. The basic premise was, if you strum a chord on a guitar, okay, mm -hmm. and then you sample that exact sound and now you're playing it on a synth, mm -hmm. they're the same thing, right? And I would say, no, they're not the same thing right. because this is very different than this. Yeah. And to me, this is very different than this. Yeah. I've had to mix some things in the box a couple times, and let me tell you, I hated it. Right. I was terrible at it. Yeah. It took way longer, yeah. and I thought it didn't sound as good. For whatever reason you want to say, I think certainly a major part of it was it didn't feel fun to me. Yeah. I was just sitting there clicking. I wasn't just like fix making it sound good, you know? Mm -hmm. I was just clicking and clicking and clicking and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. I know what you mean. So to me, I think that reaching out and grabbing a fader is quite a big deal. Yeah. As not just engineers, but as musicians, as artists, as songwriters, what you're looking for happens here. It doesn't happen here. I mean, what brought us all to music was this immersive thing. And uh, it's sad to see not just engineers, but... Uh, you know, musicians getting just focused into the, the visual aspect and not having a really human artistic form of control. Yeah. yeah. I mean, again, I'm not a purist, so I sure. don't want to, I'm not going to pretend to be that guy. Yeah. And I'm not even going to hate on people that are lucky enough to live in LA and mix in their detached garage and right. in a box. That's awesome. For yeah. Them. I just can't do it. I so I, if anything, I would view it as a shortcoming for myself that sure. I think. I don't have, I'm not wired to do whatever you have to do to get stuff to sound awesome in the box. Yeah. But I do quite like this. I hear. Well, it would be sad if we lost all of our musicians had to be people who liked computers. Uh, that would be a somewhat sad thing to me, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking about gear, there's a lot of beautiful stuff in here and a lot of beautiful stuff that I know sounds great and is fun to work with. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.